We're going to be really focusing on common conditions in clinical practice in psychiatry and primary care. And we're going to be talking about convergence, convergence not only of the phenotypes, but also convergence with respect to neurobiology and how we can treat these common conditions of depression, especially treatment-resistant depression, ADHD, as well as obesity. Uh, thank you. I want to acknowledge the sponsorship of Abbey, uh, as well as Bausch Health, Janssen, and Takeda to make this program possible. We do thank them for their support and their partnership, not only in education, but also in the research uh, that my organization is involved in, uh, in the area of depression, obesity, and cognitive impairment. You also all have the handouts. They were emailed to you. Uh, you will certainly have the opportunity to, to see the program archived on the BCD Foundation website. Uh, the biographies of both Drs. Andy Cutler and Joshua Rosenblatt are already presented uh, for you. Uh, I'll give a brief introduction to my colleagues very, very shortly. Uh, let's if we can go through the program objectives. I'm not going to read them verbatim. What we've tried to do at BCDF over the years is provide an opportunity for clinicians to have very uh, new information, innovative approaches, innovative uh, uh, avenues to help people. And we're certainly going to be doing that during this program indeed. As I mentioned, we're going to have five minutes. Uh, uh, we're going to have a, a time for Q&A. And we've got five minutes after each of the presenters, plus a 20 minute at the end, you can submit through the uh, chat room. I'm gonna start off first speaking to the topic of cognition and anhedonia. I'm gonna to speak to the topic of obesity and how it relates to obesity, but I'm also gonna broaden it up to depression, perhaps also ADHD. We're gonna follow with jo Josh Rosenblatt on treatment resistant depression. And then we're going to move into Dr. Andy Cutler's presentation on ADHD. Okay, let's begin, if we can, on the topic of cognition and anhedonia. Over the years, it has become my belief system that these two constructs are not only transdiagnostic across the entire developmental trajectory, but are the key targets therapeutically, not only in depression, but also in obesity, ADHD, and many other conditions. And we're going to talk about how we think about cognition and anhedonia in obesity especially, but we're also, in fact, going to be talking about a few of the atmospherics that are going on right now. So here's the disclosures that I have. And what I'd like to do now is just give you some of the takeaway objectives. I'm going to spend some time talking about anhedonia. We're going to really operationalize anhedonia. We're going to talk about what this means for psychiatry broadly, but also more narrowly, what it means for thinking about obesity. You're going to hear me talk about what this, how this translates and how we think about ADHD and depression and how we can think about novel treatments. Let's begin on the atmospherics. There's three atmospherics I want to speak to, one being COVID, second being the current state of the union clinically, and thirdly, the word convergence. So this is a black swan event, so-called the triple threat of the public health crisis, the economic crisis, and the mental health crisis. And this has been surrounded by malignant uncertainty. And this so-called black swan event has been followed by a very common observation, unlike a black swan, that is an uptick in mental illness. Jackie Zhao, who works with us, has recently meta-analyzed this, showing significant increases in the rates of depression, anxiety, PTSD, in many parts of the world. You've been hearing about this and now we're seeing it. Yana Lee as part of our team has done a projection analysis and what I want you to remember is the 1% rule. From the Great Recession all the way to now, for every 1% increase in unemployment, there's a commensurate 1% increase in suicide. Nobody believes that suicide is caused by one event and no one's ever committed suicide because of one singular cause. But we learned from the Great Recession in Europe and Asia and in the United States and Canada that there was this yoking of unemployment to suicide, that 1% rule. And what Yenna Lee's projected out in Canada and the United States, unless in fact the appropriate interventions are put in place, we're looking at an increase in suicide. Tragically, we're already beginning to see some of this with some countries in Asia and some countries in Europe. So it's not about flattening the curve. It's about flattening the curve and preventing the curve of mental illness, as well as conditions that are associated with suicide, that being conditions like depression. Now, we've heard so much about pre-existing conditions that leave people at risk 
of infection, hospitalization, and death due to COVID. Let's add mental illness to the pre-existing list. It's been reported by Nora Volkow and our colleague, Dr. Wang, that if you have ADHD, bipolar disorder, major depression, or schizophrenia, you are at a significantly greater risk of being infected by COVID, being hospitalized with COVID into the ICU with COVID, and unfortunately dying from COVID. And for those who actually can see those odds ratios, those odds ratios are pretty scary. Those are actually approaching what we see for morbid obesity and other pre-existing conditions. And yes, these conditions, of course, overlap together. So these are obviously very, very significant time for us. And I can't think of a more appropriate time to have this knowledge exchange. When we think about COVID, it's only amplified the unmet needs in psychiatry. We've had a congenital problem in psychiatry for a long time, that being woeful outcomes. The first antidepressant marketed was imipramine, Tofranil, in 1957. And since then, we haven't seen significant differences in overall response or remission rates with antidepressants of the monoamine variety. Perhaps what's also as relevant, perhaps even more relevant, is we haven't seen an improvement in PROs, patient reported outcomes. In other words, patients who are saying after treatment, even when they achieve remission after one treatment after the other, what they're telling us is that my quality of life is not back to normal. My functioning's back to not back to normal. I don't feel as engaged. And when you look at so-called cost of illness studies that the actuaries put out there that try to measure the cost of depression, for example, we're not actually seeing a reduction in the cost from a societal perspective. This slide you're looking at is really, in my uh, view, quite concerning that even when patients achieve remission in STAR-D, with each sequential attempt to achieve remission, Despite the fact they achieve it, their quality of life doesn't improve. And this has been a major paradigm shift in how we're beginning to think about what are the key therapeutic objectives in depression. Along with, in fact, having what I would describe as innovation stasis in the area of depression, and this translates clinically into suboptimal efficacy and PRO outcomes, People are frustrated. Uh, this is a survey from a colleague of mine in Philadelphia telling you what you know. Patients are frustrated. Uh, clinicians are frustrated. And guess what? They're frustrated at you and me. And this is understandable. And I think it is enough's enough. We need a new line of sight. We've been in a cul-de-sac too long. And we're going to talk about very novel ways to help people that are more effective, work faster, maybe even help suicide and maybe do a better job at affecting patient reported outcomes. Why are outcomes so suboptimal? Well, we just haven't had, I think, a sufficient understanding of the disease states to inform novel treatments, although we're getting there now. Secondly, uh, people like Michael Porter at Harvard would talk about the lack of the accountability, the implementation gap between what we should be doing and what's actually happening. A third I'll put out there, there's about 15 or 20 I could list, is is biases. Uh, this is something I thought was interesting insofar as if you're an overweight or obese clinician, you're less likely to counsel your patients on overweight and obesity when compared to a normal weight clinician. What's the point? The point is we have many biases, only a few of which that we're aware of, and biases affect what we're doing in clinical practice, and we tend to think within our box. We tend to really act according to what's called the familiarity heuristic as clinicians. We do what's familiar and we are often blinded by certain aspects. And I'm so amazed at how often people with bipolar disorder are misdiagnosed as having depression. How many people I see with depression whose obesity and heart disease and diabetes is never even addressed. Or people in fact who are, uh, maybe it's Occam's razor who have five or six problems but only one condition is being addressed. Let me show you another example of this which I think is really interesting. And that is, is that we did a survey looking at gender bias. Male doctors like to prescribe benzodiazepines more often to female patients than do female doctors. I think it's because of a bias, a sex stereotype, and how male doctors think about anxiety and emotionality in women. So again, these are in fact biases that we need to think about, always in fact think what best practices are, 
But this is an area we're hearing more about how some aspects like literacy around the conditions, the treatment, as well as how these biases may in fact be affecting what we're doing in clinical practice. But the takeaway message is the atmospheric during a time of COVID is a, a Copernican revolution of sorts where the focus has become very patient centric. The taketh away of mental illness doesn't equal health. We need to have treatments that give people the vitality, the flourishing, the functioning that we want them as human beings to have, but also as citizens of our society to be able to contribute. It is truly an exciting time in neuroscience and psychiatry. Just March of last year, FDA USA approved a glutamate drug, esketamine, a GABA drug, which is braxanolone for postpartum depression. This is the start of a very new era in our field. Our team in Toronto at CRTCE at UHN, as well as colleagues around the world, are beginning to look at other potential targets. And this is just a list of some of the newer targets or at least ways we're thinking about targeting these uh, areas to improve health outcomes broadly, but also in fact to improve, again, patient report outcomes for patients. Let me give you an example. Um, there's a company out of the New England called uh, Axome. They took bupropion, which we've had since 1969, and dextromethorphan, good old DM, we've had since 1949. They combined it together in the garage and made this medication, which the FDA is going to approve next year to treat major depressive disorder. Why dextromethorphan? Well, it's a glutamate drug. It's also an anti-inflammatory. It's a monoaminergic drug. It also affects sigma-1. But the point is, is that we are now looking at other paradigms and glutamate is now being brought in as long, along with inflammation and opioids, other systems. We don't want to throw babies out with bath water, but there are ways that we can synergize the current treatments that we have. Let's talk, if we can, about cognition. I want to talk about anhedonia and you can see the four familiar members of the band, the Beatles. And what we do know, in fact, is that in my world, in your world, cognition is a detractor of quality of life and function. I refer to the four dimensions of cognition as the Fab Four, like the Beatles, executive function, attention, memory, and processing speed. I always thought this was a lesion in depression and bipolar and ADHD, which it is. It's also a lesion in obesity. And along with changes in cognition, we also know there's an abnormality in anhedonia. Now, when I trained as a medical student and as a resident, I was left with the, the canard, the false story, that anhedonia is a unidimensional construct. It's actually a multidimensional construct. There's aspects of anticipation disturbance, which we call the liking, uh, the, the wanting story. Then there's aspects of the experience, which we call uh, the liking, the anticipation of pleasure is dopamine, the experience of pleasure is cannabinoid and opioid urgent. When people with obesity or ADHD or depression come to clinics, they don't say I've got a problem with anticipatory anhedonia. What they say is I'm tired, I'm fatigued, I have no motivation, I'm flat. And then what they say is, is that I also have cravings for food, I binge eat and so on. This is the modal patient we see. This is a disturbance in anticipation and experience of pleasure. So these two areas, which I call the Fab Four, as well as this double-headed monster of anhedonia, I refer to these two areas as the key detractors to quality of life and function in depression, in ADHD and in obesity. And for us to do better for patients and give them treatments that they deserve, we've got to have treatments that target these aspects of cognition as well as anhedonia. Let's look at this to some degree. This is a meta-analysis looking at obesity. And my message to you is, is that obesity metastasizes to the brain. The brain also is responsible for obesity. For example, one of those Fab Four's executive functions, they're profoundly abnormal in people who have obesity. As your body mass goes up, as your waist circumference goes up, your brain gets smaller. Someone said to me once, well, size doesn't matter. Well, the circuitry becomes abnormal. We're going to look at that in just a moment in terms of what happens in the brain. This is a study by my colleague, Sophia Frangu, when she was at Icon in uh, New York. I want you to look at the half of the slide to the right. You see those nice rainbow colors all going up? What the heck does this slide tell us? 
This slide tells us that the seafood diet, when you see food you want to eat, that's the seafood diet, is a consequence of a disconnection syndrome. ADHD and depression and obesity are a consequence of brain disconnectivity. The normal reciprocity between cognition control, which we call the central executive network, as well as the self-referential network, which we call default mode, is out of kilter with the sensorimotor system. So when you see food, it activates the system, but in a normal situation, there's a check and balance that in fact keeps your behavior in control. In obesity, like depression, ADHD, there's a disconnection. So the food then results in a crave which overwhelms the, sec the central executive network and the person begins to eat. So we've learned so much about what's causing depression by studying obesity because in the brain, they have this common substrate of disturbances in cognitive control as well as disturbances in reward-based systems. Lots of studies now have shown this, replicated, it's a robust finding that people who have, for example, obesity, have a brain reactivity pattern to the stimulus of food that's identical to a heroin addict, a cocaine addict, an alcohol abusing person. That is that there is exaggerated anticipatory experience that is craving only then to be matched by an underreactivity when exposed to the stimulus. This is something we also see in depression. We see this in ADHD, where there's this perturbation, this disconnect between the underlying hedonistic system and the cognitive control system. This idea that disturbances in cognition control in reward systems at the very circuit level is the lesion subserving depression, obesity, and ADHD is further instantiated by meta-analytic work in ADHD showing that adults and children insufficiently treated who have this condition have much higher rates of obesity. Again, the impulsive eating, the seafood eating, as well as the disturbance in reward-based decision-making. How can we evaluate reward-based decision-making? Well, we can do it by looking at what's called the effort expenditure for reward task. And the effort expenditure for reward task is a monetary reward task. It's very simple. We take our favorite laboratory animal, which is the college student, and we give them a financial reward. They tap their index finger from the dominant hand, very simple. They get a nice simple dollar for every time they tap. Now, they're re rewarded on a variable schedule, but they're rewarded nonetheless. The so-called complex task is you tap your pink, uh, pinky your, on your non-dominant hand and we variably report, uh, reward them. Uh, it can be as high as $4 to $4.50. The takeaway message is, is that when patients come to our office and they say to you and me, I'm tired, I'm overweight, I'm depressed, I can't focus, my mind's distracted, and I'm tired. When they say that they're tired, it's not because they have a lack of mitochondria. They got plenty of mitochondria, obviously being very metaphorical with that. The problem is, is that that dynamic arbitration, that silent calculation, that the effort expenditure is not worth the reward is how they're processing this, which they experience as fatigue. People, in fact, who conduct a dynamic arbitration of the effort expenditure is worth the reward actually will do the action. And it turns out that this effort expenditure task is a great uh, paradigm to tap into anticipatory reward. People who perform poorly on this particular scale or paradigm are more likely to drop out of weight management programs. Now, clinicians get very angry when patients don't do what the clinician wants. James Groves wrote a wonderful paper, 1978, New England Journal of Medicine. He was a staff at Mass General Hospital called The Hateful Patient, the patients that doctors hate. And one of them are patients who are health rejecting complainers. They just don't follow up. Doctors react with tremendous countertransference and counter, uh, counter feelings to that. What's actually the case However, in these people, it's not that they're trying to be uh, obstinate or petulant or defiant. They actually have a lesion in reward-based decision-making, which comes out in this particular paradigm. In fact, performance on the effort task accounts for about 20% of the dropout variability in weight management programs. So this theoretical framework is interesting academic cogitation, but it translates into how we got to be thinking about treating people. That is, we need to have people who have ADHD and depression, obesity, 
treat it with interventions that can engage the reward system, the cognitive control, so they can actually engage in some of the manual-based treatment approaches. Here's, in fact, ADHD. They have the same problem as people who have depression, obesity, and this decision-making is abnormal. They're more likely to make decisions that have short-term rewards at the expense of a better and more robust long-term reward later, and this is the problem they're in. Rodrigo Manser is a psychiatrist on our team at UHN. He did this really cool study where he showed that in depression, a condition known to have profound disturbance in cognition and reward, he was able to show that overweight and obesity accounted for a substantial proportion of the overall reduction in reward. As their BMI went up, these individuals had profound reductions in their performance on this effort expenditure for reward task. So everybody knows that if you have a patient who's overweight, obese, you want them to lose weight, you want them to maintain normal weight, et cetera. But I want you to be aware of the fact that obesity is metastasizing to the brain. It has a toxic effect on the cognitive control as well as the emotional network. And the patient comes in apathetic, anhedonic, they're flat, they have no vim, and we're pumping them full of one medication after the other with a lot more frustration. We have to be thinking about how we can manage above the neck and below the neck. The only drug that the FDA recognizes as being pro-cognitive outside of stimulants in ADHD and drugs for dementia is vortioxetine. I think by now most know this. The, com the company Takeda, uh, sorry, Lundbeck in, in the United States, Takeda had promoted this, but they also in fact have the evidence to support the direct and independent effect of vortioxetine in targeting cognition. We also have data from our team in Toronto showing that reward improvements are really intertwined with cognition improvements. Vortioxetine not only improves general cognition, but also improve reward-based decision-making. And that makes perfect sense to me because from an evolutionary perspective, the cognitive control networks, if they evolve, if they co-evolve with reward, that would have advantage to the organism to remember where those opportunities are for copulation, those opportunities are for feeding. And so no wonder these primitive systems are in fact intertwined. That silent arbitration that we all do is the effort expenditure worth the reward involves aspects of executive function, so-called working memory. And again, this is a silent calculus. We don't do this overtly, this is silent. And as we improve our executive function, we see improvements in reward-based decision-making Probably why psychostimulants and ADHD, which are potently procognitive, also benefit patients with respect to their reward-based decision-making. I would intuit that this would also apply to some other very novel approaches like ketamine and a few others we're going to talk about maybe later on this morning. Now, psychostimulants I use off-label in depression. We know they're approved. Some of them are for binge eating disorder. Of course, Andy's going to talk about ADHD. I receive emails from colleagues saying, hey, Roger, you recommended a stimulant for my patient with depression. Do you think they have ADHD? And no, I, I don't, maybe they do, but I'll, that's not why I'm recommending them. But Vyvanse and long-acting methylphenidates like Boquest and others, modafinil in some cases, Primapexol is not really a stimulant, but it has dopamine activity. We use that one, one to three milligrams as well in depression. Why am I using it? I'm using it theoretically to target the, the FAB4, but also using it theoretically to tackle that double-headed monster, especially the anticipation of pleasure, which is dopaminergic. And psychostimulants have been shown to be very effective in treating uh, cognition discontrol in people who have major depression. It's a shame that Pfizer uh, <clears throat> no longer has promoted Pristique or venlafaxine, or Lily with duloxetine, because I do conjecture that SNRIs would be beneficial for some of these areas, especially fatigue, because of the role that catecholamines play, not only in cognition, but also play in reward-based decision-making. So we're not gonna really know the answer, but Pristique and venlafaxine, duloxetine, all have been shown to improve function. Um, other SNRI, which is really an NSRI, is Fetsima, levomilnasopran, 
I did a meta-analysis showing that this drug is especially effective for people with psychomotor retardation, especially effective for apathy. And, and my conceptual work was this was targeting, again, the cognition control and the reward-based uh, decision-making. I'd like to, if I can now, uh, just finish off with a couple of more slides. This is now Trexone and Bupropion. Now, now Trexone is a opioid antagonist. It, it actually antagonizes more than one of the receptors of the opioid system. We've had it since 65, like Bupropion 69. It's also a fossil. We know it best in my clinic because we've used it for years for opioid use disorder and alcohol use disorder. I worked with Arexogen many years ago um, <clears throat> with a colleague um, uh, in California in really thinking about combining naltrexone with uh, bupropion. And again, bupropion, we, we've known for years, its role in depression, seasonal depression, off-label in ADHD, but also for smoking cessation. Uh, by the way, bupropion is in the top 25 prescribed drugs in America. So it's a very popular drug that uh, in clinical practice when you combine it with naltrexone, it's, it's, it's a mathematic that we like in psychiatry, one plus one equals 10, insofar as you get a synergistic effect on key neurochemical systems implicated in cognition control, as well as reward. Now, one could conjecture this could have a role to play in drug and alcohol abuse. Of course, there are always concerns about seizure, but the reason it was developed primarily was to target obesity. Because at the time, the world began to change and obesity was increasingly being conceptualized as a disorder of addiction. And there was something wrong in the cognitive control, the FAB4, as well as those two dimensions of, of, of hedonism that were thought to predispose and portend behaviors that led to uh, obesity. And what was interesting was knowing that the rats lose weight, but the brain of humans who took this product began to exhibit changes in the brain circuitry that were thought to be subserving the behavior of seafood diet. In other words, remember I talked how people with elevated BMI have a disturbance in the brain circuitry, more specifically, the circuitry that's integrating cognition decisions with sensor and motor activity? Well, those systems are reset by this combination. That sounds like a check mark for the cognition control over the behavior, but the naltrexone part was also beneficial insofar as helping with aspects of reward-based decision-making. When the company developed it, they in fact showed this significant weight loss, but more especially in people who have an absence of crave or who have a lot of craving where this would target the crave. So for me, this has tremendous relevance, obviously to manage obesity, but it's also relevant to what we need in psychiatry, in depression and ADHD. Treatments that can target cognition control and reward-based decision-making. I have spent over 20 years managing uh, people with depression and there's no, uh, no doubt about it that apathy, avolition, um, anhedonia, fatigue, these are the most common problems. And I thought for many years, what's going on here? I think we all know what fatigue is. It's like that famous 1964 quip from the Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart in the United States. He said, I know what porn is, but I find it hard to define. I know what it is that I'm looking at, but I find it hard to define. And fatigue was always that way for me. And, and fatigue now is understood as a disturbance in cognition control at FAB4, as well as that double-headed monster of hedonism, that is the anticipation experience of pleasure. We in psychiatry love to poach medications. Uh, I always use the example of memantine. Memantine was developed by Lilly in 1968 for diabetes. It didn't work. Um, and it was then repurposed as an anti-dementia drug where frankly it doesn't work that well there either. But the point being is that memantine is a glutamate drug. That is the Oxetine was developed as an anti-diabetic and there's a few other examples like that. Well, this is Victoza liraglutide. We use it as our drug of choice for weight management in some of our patients along with Contrae. Liraglutide has also been shown to cause weight loss through its central effect on incretin systems located in the nucleus tractus. But Rodrigo Manser led a really cool study here as well showing proof of concept that this diabetes, this weight loss drug 
is able to improve cognition control, we think to some extent, but also really effective reward-based decision-making in patients with depression. And we often at the MDPU and UHN will use a drug like this to target fatigue and apathy. So um, this is what, how we're trying to take theoretical frameworks and we're trying to take this information and translate it into better treatments that can work uh, more meaningful for people who are suffering from mood disorders who have apathy and cognitive control problems. So the takeaway is, is that whether you're targeting depression, ADHD, or obesity, think about what's the cognition element here, what's the reward-based disturbance. The theoretical framework brings all these conditions together, converging on these networks as I described them, and treatments that we are developing broadly in psychiatry now are attempting to target one or more aspects of the FAB4 and or that double-headed monster of hedonistic disturbance. I'm going to stop there for now. I have time for just a couple of questions. I'm going to pass the floor over to um, uh, Dr. Rosenblatt. So here's a question. Would I consider obesity and its complications in depression and addiction? I do, actually. And uh, Nora Volkow at NIDA has really made a strong case around this. Uh, if you look at the molecular systems, the brain circuit systems, the behavioral systems, the phenomenological systems, there are a lot of overlaps. And I do see it that way. And it's a disturbance in cognition control as well as hedonistic uh, systems. I'll take one more question. How are the comorbidities of pain and addiction linked? Very complicated story. Pain is a three hour discussion, but maybe to keep it just tight, pain is not just a emotional experience, it is a cognitive experience. And uh, there's no doubt about it that we need better treatments for pain. And when you're now thinking about what really works for chronic pain, some of the psychosocial modalities, some of the pharmacologic modalities, what you can uh, uh, gather is that they actually target one or more aspects of cognitive control, as well as reward-based decision making. Uh, I'm gonna take one more question because I love this one. When I refer to lesions, I refer to a physical lesion. I certainly am. So in the brain, the circuitry that we have in our brain is dancing like Ginger Rogers and Fred Astaire. They're in reciprocity with each other. That's a normal functioning brain. In ADHD, obesity, and in a, uh, depression, they are literally structurally and functionally disconnected. In psychosocial treatments, maybe neurostimulation like ECT, pharmacologic treatments, maybe others we're gonna talk about like ketamine, in fact, can reset the circuitry. And we see that not just with ketamine, but also with some of the psychostimulants. We'll have more time for Q&A a bit later. I wanna keep us on time. I'm gonna pass the floor off now to Dr. Josh Rosenblatt.